In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Ghost, amen. In today's gospel, we see our Lord once again in Galilee. And it is in Cana of Galilee that Christ worked his first miracle, where he transformed water into wine. And his first apostles, his disciples, believed in him. Today's gospel takes place likewise in Galilee. And this man, the father of a son who is gravely ill, at the point of death, this father, either he was there at the wedding feast and knew of this miracle, or he heard from others of Christ and the wonderful miracles that he could work, and he's at his last end. I think perhaps only a parent can experience appreciate the anxiety of this father when his son is at the point of death. He is trying every means possible. He's looking for help. And finally, he hears or he recalls that Christ works miracles. He goes to Christ begging him, come down and cure my son. He's at the point of death. Please hurry. And I find perhaps these words of Christ a little harsh, but I don't know the state of men, and I know that Christ was not too harsh. But our Lord says to this man, unless you see signs and wonders, you do not believe. And there are occasions in throughout the scriptures, and I hear the words of Christ, and it kind of stings. I mentioned the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. Recall, Mary comes to Jesus and she says, they have no wine. He says, what is it to you, woman? What is it to me and you? And I think, how harsh, how disrespectful. But again, I don't speak Aramaic. I don't speak Hebrew, I don't know the context, I don't know really much about it, but I am certain that when Christ spoke, he spoke with authority, he spoke with power, but he also spoke with compassion. He spoke with love, for after these seemingly harsh words, he changes water into wine at the request of his mother. Seemingly after these harsh words to this father, unless you see signs and wonders you do not believe, sir, please come down, hurry. He says, go your way, your son lives. Our Lord shows his mercy, he shows his compassion. And very often, I think with those around us, we misinterpret what they have to say. Perhaps it's because I'm a little bit tone deaf. Women are more susceptible to tonality. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. I'm sorry, how did I say it? And I do believe that we often read more into people's tonality than is actually there. And we accuse them of having motives which perhaps they don't have because it comes off awkward, harsh, abrasive, and we say, oh, the love of God is not there. And I can say, look at our Lord. Hear these words that have been translated probably pretty literally into the English language and how they're understood. And I'm amazed at some things that I say in my sermons. I have to be careful with my choice of words but I don't even know which words they're going to take out of context today. The words are changing meaning constantly. And I have to wait till after the sermon. Somebody says, Your Excellency, uh, in the modern lingo today, this means something completely different. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) That's not what I had in mind at all. And hopefully the hearers understood correctly, or as I like to quote, Bishop Lewis, he had a very clever saying. He said, if I've said anything wrong, please misunderstand correctly. But our Lord speaks 
these words to the man? The man obviously came to Christ because he at least had a hope that Christ can do something for his son. It's his last effort, if you will. Hurry, please, my son is dying. He had enough faith, he had enough trust, enough belief to come to Christ. But I dare say it was probably his last call. He's already tried the doctors. He's already tried the local people. He's already tried the midwives, the nurses, whoever he could get a hold of, any wise tale that he could probably get a hold of. You know, dig up these herbs and you cook them at this temperature and then you make this concoction and you do this and you do that and everything will be fine. He's probably exhausted all of that and Christ is his last hope. And so that, in that frame, I can understand our Lord's harsh words. Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. What kind of people are you? But even with that, our Lord says, go, your son lives. And this gospel tells us the man believed the word of Christ. When Christ spoke, there was something about the way he spoke that this man understood. He believed. My son lives, and now I must go home. I must go back and see my son again. And he believes, I'm going to see my son alive when I get home. But I dare say his faith is not yet complete. Because on his way home, the servants are coming to meet him. And they say, don't bother the master, your, your son is alive. And he says, well, what hour did he get better? He said, yesterday at the seventh hour. And this father knows that was at the very hour that Christ said, thy son lives. And the gospel tells us the man believed. So I see three stages in this man's belief. His belief in Christ when he first came to him, even though it was his, probably his last attempt. When Christ spoke to him, his faith, I think, increased. The man believed the word of Christ. And now again we see the servants come and tell him, at the very hour that Christ spoke these words, the fever left your son. He is better now. He is healthy. And now he believes again. Or I would say his faith increases, but not only his faith, but the faith of his entire household. Everybody believes because everybody has either seen or heard of this miracle that has transpired. I go into great detail with this because I want us to be able to relate to that father and perhaps compare our spiritual life to that father. Perhaps compare our faith to that father. How often is God our last recourse? We want something, we need something, we try everything, and when everything else has failed, then we turn to God. And I would suggest that, contrary-wise, we should turn to God first. We should offer a prayer to God, even in this emergency. While you're waiting for 911 to answer, you can still ask God to have mercy. <laughs> it only takes a moment to lift your heart and mind to God. And I suggest that Christ should be our first call. Lord, have mercy on us. Show us your kindness and have that faith. And then from there, let us hear the word of God. If we're nowhere near where someone is speaking the word of God, we can pick it up. We should all have a Bible in our home and the pages of the New Testament especially the four evangelists, they should be pretty well worn. You shouldn't have to tear the pages apart from the printing where they were still stuck together. 
That's one of my challenges when people show me their Bible on the shelf when I go to their homes. See, we have a Bible right here. I like to open it up and perhaps flip through some pages. You didn't even cut these pages apart yet. They're still stuck together from a printing man misfunction here. What good is your Bible sitting on the shelf if you haven't read it? What good is the Gospels if you're not paying attention, if you're not hearing the Word of God, or at least reading the Word of God? How is your faith going to grow? How are you going to believe? What are you going to believe? We emphasize the scriptures, the catechism to our children. And I've even seen catechism books, some really old ones where the pages are yellow and still in the back towards the appendix, there's one page that still hasn't been cut apart. (laughs) They're still together from the printing. Old books. How many children have been flipped through this book and were never curious enough to look in the appendix? and see what was there. How are we going to grow unless we read, unless we listen for the voice of God, the voice of Christ? And I can say, yes, you don't technically need to have to read. You don't even need to know how to read. And if your eyes are open, you can hear the voice of God in the world around you. Nature is speaking of the works of God constantly. If you're paying attention, if you're looking, the birds of the air singing their song, the deer, the fishes, they are all beautiful, and if we're paying attention, we see that they're speaking to us. St. Augustine, in his confessions, goes through a very lengthy meditation I've examined all of creation, and I've heard what creation has to say, and it all speaks to me of thee, my God. All these creatures tell me, we haven't made ourselves. Don't worship me. Don't look at me. I'm just a creature like you are. We have the same creator, the same God. And St. Augustine obviously does a much better, more beautiful work than I can even suggest to you in his analysis of all of creation. He hears the word of God. I say we too can do that if we will open our hearts and minds to hear the word of God, to see the works of God all around us. Our faith is going to grow. but it is not yet complete. We still do not have life within us, and Christ has made it clear for our faith to be perfect. You want life in you? He who eats my body and drinks my blood has life in him. Unless we come physically to Christ and physically receive him, Our faith is yet incomplete. It's time for us to realize this, realize our weakness, realize the tragedy in where we stand, just as this man in today's gospel did. It may be that we have a crisis in our life, and we've gone to see everyone we can think of, help me with my crisis, turn to God in humble prayer. Come to God and say, Lord, help me. I'm drowning in this mess. This is more than I can bear. This is more than I can understand. Help me. And yes, he may say, take up your cross and come follow me. This is a burden. You need the burden, and I can't argue with God. He says, I need a cross. He sends me a cross. That is his will. Let's bear that cross for the love of him. Let's not go get angry at God because he's given us this cross and we think it's unbearable. He knows what is best. If he rebukes us, we need a rebuke. If he sends us an illness, it's because we need an illness. We can still beg him, Lord, this cross is getting more. Help me. 
Take it away, please. And if you can't take it away, Lord, please give me the grace to bear with it. And when we reach that point, when we can say, Lord, if you can't take it away, please give me the grace to carry it as I ought to carry it in love of you. Our faith grows just a little bit. But it is going to be perfected. As our faith grows, we receive Christ. We become one with Christ. We repeat the reception of the sacraments so that we can grow, we can become perfect. Our goal is to reach that point when we can say with St. Paul, it's no longer I, but it is Christ living within me. I am no longer concerned about the things of this world because I'm only concerned about the things of heaven. I don't worry about laying up treasure here on earth for my retirement. I am more concerned about laying up treasure in heaven for my eternity. I am seeking first the kingdom of God and its justice, knowing full well that whatever I need in this life, I have a Father in heaven who knows what I need, who will take care of me. And sometimes his words are harsh. Sometimes they're difficult for us to hear. But we should not turn away from him. We should turn to him with even greater faith, greater trust. Beg him. Trust him as the Blessed Mother did, even though he said, Woman, what is it to me? What is it to you? My hour has not yet come. Have that faith of the Blessed Virgin. Say to the servants within your own home, Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Everything will be fine. God is in charge. It will all work out. Just do whatever he tells you. Have the faith in that persistence, if you will, of the Father in today's gospel. Lord, please help me. Until we hear those consoling words, go, your son lives. Be consistent, be persevering. Pray, as St. Paul would tell us, without ceasing. Always lift up your heart to God and we will grow stronger. And then hopefully at the end of our life, we will say with St. John in the Apocalypse, come, Lord Jesus, come. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descended super vos, et maniat semper, amen.